You know, today marks the start of Disability Pride Month, something we'll be celebrating all July. And it's my honor to begin our celebration with an activist within the deaf community, Niall DeMarco. He's a model, filmmaker, and author of his new memoir, Deaf Utopia. And as someone who was raised by Teachers for the Deaf, this assignment gave me a lot of pride and was truly a gift to sign my way through. Have you achieved deaf utopia? If breaking barriers and shattering stereotypes equals everything perfect. Congratulations, Niall. You are America's Next Top Model. Niall DeMarco has nailed it. I remember when I first won America's Next Top Model, my mom actually ran backstage and she came on set and immediately I said, I want to change the world. Coda. <laughs> Within a changing industry. This is our moment. It's a sign of the times. Was the Oscars a watershed moment? Truly. But what most people don't realize is that along with Coda, we had something from our community represented in five different categories. And now a new book revealing his roots in representing deaf culture, his love letter to a way of life. How many times do hearing people say to you, deafness, it's a disability, and you say, no, 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 deafness, it's a culture. Absolutely, absolutely. So many times hearing people will question whether or not we have a culture. They're hesitant to believe that it even exists, but in fact, we have a language, which means we have culture. I do hope that this book provides a little bit more insight to those people and that they see that my upbringing. Four generations of Italian deaf dinners, drive and determination. Mom, you knew you had to be an advocate. Why? Well, because of my parents. I'm gonna cry, sorry. So because of my parents, um, they went to an oral school growing up. They weren't allowed to use sign language. And I decided when I had kids, their language, their right to have language is American Sign Language. She taught us, you know, that there was no glass ceiling, that we could do whatever we wanted. And it didn't matter if we could hear or not. Here we are, Gala Debt Theater. It feels good, it feels good. Life lessons Niall took to his alma mater, Gala Debt, the famed university for the deaf in Washington, D.C., setting the stage for an award-winning career while inspiring younger deaf dreamers to be the change. If someone had told me five years ago that I would have won two different reality TV shows, that I would have produced two different docu-series on Netflix, that one of those would be nominated for an Oscar, and that I would be writing a book, I would absolutely say it was impossible. Deaf Utopia. I'm achieving it. I think slowly and bit by bit, but I'll never be satisfied. I'm insatiable and I always want more. And not long after his book came out, I caught up with Niall here in studio on his newest projects, along with his interpreter, Gray Van Pelt. It's incredible to see you again. Thank you for having me back. Well, of course, I signed with you in the piece, but this will go a lot faster. You won't have to wait on how much I need to <laughs> practice with my sign language. So we'll keep the conversation going. <laughs> no problem. You know, I, lo no I love problem. to sign with you. No, likewise, <laughs> likewise. So the last time we were together, we were talking about your book. It's now a New York Times bestseller. How has this opened up the door for more opportunities when it comes to deaf advocacy? You know, I mean, first of all, I am mind blown <laughs> that it was a bestseller. I could have never possibly imagined that when we went to publish it. You know, it, it's easy to think that people weren't interested in my stories, but to find out that so many people are hungry for more really confirms the need that we have right now for more deaf writers, for more deaf people producing and telling their stories. Ironically, during the same time that I published my book, two other deaf writers published theirs. And it's thrilling to see that time is really shifting and it very much feels like our moment. But 
we're really looking for more doors to be open, and I'm hoping that these three books are the momentum that really pushes that movement forward. Okay, you always look for a unique door to open because now you're producing a series on deaf punk. Yeah. Okay, what is deaf punk? And I love the sign, by the way, deaf punk, because you get the, <laughs> you get the mohawk yeah. in there. Exactly. It's very cool. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> rad. But <clears throat> funny, you know, in history when this actually happened, many people within our own community didn't know, right? In college, you know, in reading deaf history, I had a chance to learn about this story. This was often passed down through tradition um, about a deaf club in San Francisco that would host deaf, or would host punk bands essentially to play there as a venue, which was incredible. They would have these really loud rock and roll groups in a place where most of the people couldn't hear them. For us, a deaf club is more of a self-help uh, center, right? Where you can find resources and networking and where you can sort of collaborate within your community. But to be able to use this as a venue for 18 months really became essentially a mini Studio 54. So many famous performers and bands had a chance to come in, celebrities flew in for it, and so many of the stories that had come out during that time are incredible and really speak more to the movements that were going on at the time. I'm so excited. I'm thrilled to be able to tell this story and especially to be able to do it with Morgan Freeman's production company. It's just amazing. You know, hearing people have asked me for so many years because, you know, my parents were, were teachers for the deaf. You know, how do deaf people ex appreciate music? How do they dance? How do they, how do they understand it? And I always have to explain the vibration, the feeling. You enjoy music just as much as we do. Absolutely, absolutely. Deaf people do have our own relationship and our own feeling with music. We have a heightened sensitivity to it, right? I mean, we've lost one sense and essentially gained a heightened sensitivity in all the others. So being able to be in tune with the vibrations and also understand music on a much deeper level. Funny enough, my twin brother, who is deaf as well, is also a DJ. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he's done that by learning to practice and to really perfect and hone his craft. You know, I'm excited to be able to tell the story of deaf punk because I think I think this is breaking the mold of what we've seen on TV and in film historically. When we see content about deaf people, it's often focused on their inability to hear and understand music. But if instead we reclaim this, right, and we tell the world deaf people can actually really enjoy music. Deaf punk during the 1970s you know, it was a lot about the vibrations and was a lot about what was happening sort of within the world of music, right? And this became such an incredible microcosm for the genre to really explode. Thrill. Talking about reclaiming deaf culture, you're working on another limited series, Deaf President Now. Let's go back to 1988, Gallaudet University, where you graduated from. We actually found a piece we did here on ABC Nightline, did a whole, uh, in-depth report on it, on this protest. Take us back and why this moment in time was so important for the deaf and for Gallaudet University. Oof. The 1988 protest was an incredibly critical time for us. It was a time for us to come together to end 124 years of hearing paternalistic control of the university. And we won our fight. We were able to get a deaf president. It also gave much of the rise to the passage of the ADA, which is now a law that protects not only deaf people, but dis disabled people all around the uh, US in really providing us rights. So the impact that it had from that single university is far reaching and it's a story I am excited to tell. All right, we're gonna have a little fun with you now. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know what I'm up to. You can I'm see what's coming. Here, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we'll so see. As we wait for Def Punk and and Def uh, President now, your projects come out. We're gonna do a little light, lightning rod here, okay? On on the theme of punk, favorite punk band. Ooh, I'd have to say, oh, it's tough. I don't know if I could say that there's one, but in studying Def Punk, I have really fallen in love with the Def Dead Kennedys. Oh, Dead Kennedys. Yeah, and still, they're incredibly well known to this day and loved, and they performed at the club in San Francisco, so, you know, they were a part of our history as well. Perfect, one of my faves also. Okay, if you could play any Def, any punk rocker, if you could play any punk rocker, alive or dead, who would it be? Well, um, I'd have to say David Bowie. Ooh. Yeah. 
David Bowie is incredible, but what he was able to do with his androgyny and how he was able to become a queer icon for so many of us, ah, oh, nothing but love. Love it. Great music. My son loves to drum all David Bowie songs, of course, right? All right, if you could play any musician, who would it be? Ooh, any musician in a movie. Yes. Ooh, that is a really good question. Now's your moment. Agents are watching. Um, ooh, maybe Elvis. Ooh. I'd, I'd have to see Elvis Presley, yeah. I mean, he's, <laughs> you know, one, he's incredible and, you know, incredibly good looking, but also I think it would be a lot of fun to play. Oh, well, you've got that down. You have the short hair, the beautiful eyes. Shall we continue? <laughs> okay. What's a sign for Elvis? Ooh. I don't think we... There, there isn't I one. All right, yeah. we'll work on that. I don't know. <laughs> Your favorite music? Ooh. Mm, I would say because of my twin brother, I really enjoy rap. I really like, you know, growing up it was really enjoyable. So, I and rap is probably what I know best as far as a genre. It's specific to the rhythm and the pacing of music that I really like. So yeah, I'd say that genre. You can feel the beat. Genre. I mean, it's perfect. Right, right. No, and that's the best, right? You know, it's what we all need. All right, and finally, if you were not doing what you're doing now, what would you pick as a career? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> what would I be doing? Um, probably teaching at a university. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably be teaching math or, I don't know, something else maybe. But, you know, something fun. Yes, yeah, because you did well in math in college, that's why. Right, yes. yeah, definitely, you know, and I taught a little bit as well. I had a little bit of experience in the classroom before I came into this industry. So, you know, I'm, I don't know how that would look, but yeah, maybe. Niall, you're already a teacher. You're teaching all of us. You're teaching the world about deaf culture. Um, you're breaking down stereotypes. It's, you're, you're already doing it. You're making the impact. And I'm so glad that you are here and I'm so glad we got to meet. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.